Um, I was going to talk about multiple species and multiple threatening processes, but the time kept getting shorter and shorter for this talk. So I'm going to talk about one threatened species, which has become pretty much our sort of flagship species in a way, that's the swift parrot. And I'm going to talk about one major threatening process, which is threatening to drive them to extinction very, very quickly, unless we do something about it. Um, just quickly, an introduction to Team Swift Parrot. Uh, it's myself and three truly wonderful postdocs, uh, Debbie Saunders, Matt Webb, and Dejan Stojanovic, D for short. Uh, these guys are incredibly dedicated. They're very, very skilled field biologists and scientists, and they're also very good at disseminating the results and getting the uh, public on side. I take my hat off to them. I can't say enough good things about them. Um, now, the thing you need to know about swift parrots is that they need hollows in trees, uh, naturally formed hollows in trees for nesting. Um, and they're very, very choosy about which hollows they use. Um, they need tall, old, old growth forest because it's the older trees that make more hollows. But what they're really after is very deep hollows that have small um, entrances. And they're choosy for very, very good reasons. And that is that there are lots of things that try to get in and eat them if the, ent if the entrance is... Um... So we put out cam camera traps on a you know, regular basis. We have hundreds of, out of camera traps out there in the, in the forest. And almost every day we catch things trying to get in to eat the swift parrots. And you know, they would get in if the entrance was, um, wasn't small enough to keep them out. So currawongs are a common culprit. These are all pictures taken by the camera traps. Uh, various raptors like goshawks try to get in. There's a brown falcon having a go. Um, at night time, things come out and try to get into the hollows as well, so the owls get active. These are boo books trying to get into the nest hollow. Uh, Brush-tailed possums are everywhere, and they certainly try on a regular basis. And some of these things also compete for the, um, uh, for the nest hollows as well. <laughs> so basically, there's a housing shortage for the swift parrots. Um, uh, hollows are rare, and good usable hollows are even rarer. Only about 5% of the hollows that you see from the ground as you walk through a woodland are actually usable by swift parrots as nesting sites. And as I've emphasized already, the good hollows protect the, um, the nests from, from predators, creatures that would get in if they could to eat the mother and the, um, and the babies. So when all goes well, uh, this is what you see. Um, this is meant to be a video, but I don't really have time to show it all. But that's a mother swift parrot. Uh, she's incubating a clutch of four eggs. She's far back in a nest chamber. And she's incredibly docile and tame. Um, you know, you can dangle outside the, the, the hollow on a rope as a researcher, and she won't move. She won't budge. She just looks back at you. Um, they've uh, evolved over the eons. They feel safe. You know, they've chosen the hollows very carefully. Nothing can get at them, so they just don't feel troubled very much by anything that's outside the hollow like that. Um, also, when things go well, um, they produce an average of about three fledglings. Um, these guys are about a week off fledgling, uh, fledging. It's a very nice time to ha handle them. Uh, they've got that down on them. They're all, and they're also very docile and tame at that stage. They don't seem to show any fear at all. So that's when things are all going well. Uh, but things are not all well in Tasmania. Uh, the swift parrots have faced multiple threatening processes. The most controversial one is habitat loss. But I'm not going to talk about habitat loss today. I'm going to circle back in on the predation issue instead. Um, and just to reiterate that normally the swift parrots choose their hollows very, very carefully um, and in a way that keeps them safe from their native predators. But we silly humans have gone and introduced a predator into the system that shouldn't be there. It's the sugar glider. Uh, they're from mainland Australia. And they um, uh, were introduced into Tasmania sometime in the 19th century. But in recent decades, they've just proliferated, but gone crazy. And they've occupied every patch of woodland on the main island of Tasmania. And the trouble with sugar gliders is that they're small. And their head size, in particular, is only the size of a swift parrot's head. So anywhere a swift parrot can go, a sugar glider can go too. So that breaks down this, this wonderful evolved system that would have kept the, um, uh, the, the swift parrot safe. So they're small, and they can enter the hollows where the swift parrots are breeding. And they kill and eat the incubating adult female swift parrot. And they do that at a really alarmingly high frequency. It's really quite horrific, this carnage. So if you climb up to the nest hollow, this is what you usually find. You find a dead female who was incubating eggs, and she's been killed for her trouble. It's either a fresh carcass, like on that side, or a carcass that's been totally eaten. Uh, the sugar gliders go in and kill the female, and they won't just consume her in one go. They'll leave her there, and they'll come back over multiple days, and they'll keep snacking until she's finally consumed. 
like the one on that side. Um, so sugar gliders have ended up being an unexpectedly uh, uh, dire threat to swift parrots, one that nobody really expected and one that we've, uh, a threat that we've only discovered recently. It was uh, D, my postdoc, who discovered all of this and he sounded the alarm bells uh, in 2014. Um, but basically the rates of mortality are incredibly high. That's on the main island of Tasmania, a female, 83% I mean, of nesting females are being killed by sugar gliders. It's a rate that's just so phenomenally high, it's hard to believe. And it's only made slightly more bearable by the fact that on the few occasions when the birds go to the offshore islands, there's no sugar gliders out there, so they are safe from this form of predation. If you average those two figures, the 83% and the zero, and you um, balance for, the, for where, where they breed and how often, the rate comes down to about 50% per year. So every year, about 50% of breeding female swift parrots are getting eaten by sugar gliders. Clearly unsustainable. We put it all together into a population viability analysis, um, and it wasn't rocket science to be able to predict that a severe population crash was going to happen, and it happened quite soon. So this graph is the key result from the population viability analysis. Uh, population size on the y-axis started off with somewhere around 2,000 birds. This is a 16-year time frame, a very, very short time frame. These things are often done over 100 years, and, you know, and the results feel sort of safely far off in the future. But this is only 16 years, and um, you know, half of us will still be in our jobs in 16 years. And it's not very much time. It's well within our lifetimes, put it that way. Um, and you can see that the whole thing is crashing away to next to zero birds in 16 years. Uh, we're up to year two since that analysis was done. So if you read up to the line there, you can see that we've already lost about a quarter of the population since the analysis was done. So what do we do about this dire threat to swift parrots? Um, it's not easy, not an easy problem to solve, but we are making some inroads and I'll get there in a moment. Um, sugar gliders are widespread in Tasmania. Uh, we've surveyed for them, we've done the climate modelling. And all the brown areas there on that um, map there in the Swift Parrot Range, they're all the woodlands and they're all occupied by sugar gliders. Sugar gliders have got everywhere in Tasmania except two places, Mariah Island and Bruni Island, which to this point in time are free of sugar gliders still. Now just before I tell you what we've started doing to, to help things out, um, I need to tell you that Swift Parrots move around a lot. Um, they're very mobile birds and they never settle to breed in the same place uh, two years in a row. One year they'll be in the north of the state in Tasmania, <clears throat> next year they'll be in the southern forests, and the year after they'll be up on the eastern seaboard somewhere. And what they're doing is they're chasing the, um, the flowering eucalyptus trees, mainly the blue gums but also the black gums. And those trees tend to flower in local patches. So the swift parrots move around, they find the place that has the, the best patch of flowering trees and they'll set up there to nest. And of course they have to have nest hollows nearby for the whole thing to, to work. I don't have time to go through the survey techniques. Uh, this is Matt Webb's work, but very, very clever uh, techniques based on surveying a thousand sites every year. And it allows us to um, map the trajectory of the population, where they go and how well they're doing. But it's also allowed us to predict uh, what's going on. And that allows um, uh, us to actually make some good targeted conservation uh, decisions and take actions. So we know from Matt Webb's long-term uh, study already that um, they breed on predator-free islands every three years or so on average. And again, that's just on average because it depends on whether the trees are flowering there in that particular year. And Matt was able to predict that 2016, so this year, uh, was going to be a bumper year for Bruni Island, what we call a masked flowering event. He wandered through the landscape and he could tell by the flower buds that just about every blue gum on, on Bruni Island was going to erupt into this beautiful white blossom that you can see in the picture there. So Bruni Island was going to have a masked flowering event. So that means plenty of food for swift parrots and the population should be drawn to Bruni Island, which is fantastic news. The trouble being is that Bruni Island is only quite a small patch of land and it's got fragmented woodlands and forests on it and there aren't enough breeding sites. There are not enough hollows there. So our solution uh, was to add hollows, add breeding opportunities for the birds. So we've been running around uh, putting nest boxes um, up into the treetops on Bruni Island. Um, our aim is 500, we have 400 up so far. We'll get, we'll get to 500 before too long. And the other thing we've been doing is actually cutting artificial hollows into dead branches of trees. So creating artificial nesting sites in that way. And it says 55 there, but we're now up to about 70 or so. And this latest effort was really made possible by this wonderful team of um, arborists that came down to Tasmania from Melbourne. 
I just volunteered their time and service, services, about 35 of them. And they just went crazy all over Bruni Island. They were climbing trees, they were putting nest boxes up on top of trees, and they were pulling out the little chainsaws and cutting hollows um, in, in, in the dead branches. Um, an incredible effort, uh, very heartwarming stuff. These guys have really changed things for us and made this aim possible, our aim being to make Bruni Island a fantastic place to breed in 2016. We have made it. And even better, we have early success or signs of early success. Uh, we know that all the natural hollows on Bruni Island were occupied by breeding swift parrots and then there were still a lot of other females milling around looking for places to breed. So there were birds that didn't have anywhere to breed before we did anything. Um, but they've started going into the nest boxes, which is the first time that swift parrots have ever been recorded using nest boxes. We thought they might be shy of them and they'd take a year or two to get used to them before they use them. But no, they've gone straight in. And 11 out of 40 that have been checked so far have, um, have uh, swift parrot clutches in them. So it's a fantastic start to the season. And even better, sort of like the cream on the cake, um, we've got the largest clutch size that we've ever recorded in the whole six year uh, breeding uh, data set so far. Normally, the swift parrots lay three, four, five eggs, and it usually de it depends on how good they perceive the conditions to be, so they'll lay more eggs when they think that they're going to do better. We've had this record clutch size of six eggs, and you can see it there at the bottom of the, of the nest box. One, two, three, four, five, six eggs. And that's a sign that the, the birds themselves agree with us that it's going to be a bumper year on Bruni Island, and they seem to be working in the belief that they'll be able to pump out an extra chick or two. So extremely heartwarming stuff. Taking to the next bo nest boxes, um, also occupying all the, um, the original natural cavities as well. So just to wrap up, the question now is um, can we change that really horrible, that dire population trajectory that I showed you originally? And there it is up there on, the, uh, on that side. That's the numbers predicted to crash away to nothing in 16 short years. Uh, you know, we have very few swift parrots left after that time if we didn't do anything. And this is what we're hoping for. This is projecting forward again, uh, but we're just, by adding swift boxes and this year here, you can see there's a spike. So rather than continuing to crash down, we're hoping to increase the population by a few hundred birds this year uh, in two ways. One is that the swift parrot females would normally go off to the mainland and they get killed for their trouble. If they come over and nest on Bruni Island, then they get spared from predation, but also because it's a bumper um, mast flowering year, we're hoping that they can get more chicks than they normally do. So we'll, you know, wait and see how it goes and we'll count them later on, but we're hoping for a, few, a boost of a few hundred in this year alone. And then the trajectory then would be that we'll, it will keep coming down, we can't stop that, but every time there's a good flowering event on Bruni Island, the birds will go there and hopefully breed better than they would have and we'll get a spike in numbers before they keep coming down again. And all this really means is that rather than ending up with no birds at the end of 16 years, hopefully this way we'll end up with you know, a good, good number. You know, I'm not going to guess as to how many, but hopefully a meaningful number that we will have left in the world and we can still work with in terms of our conservation actions. And what it really means is that we're sort of, it's a way of stalling for time as we work on other solutions uh, in the longer term for really what we can do about um, the terrible problem of uh, sugar gliders um, on the main island of Tasmania, which is proving to be very hard so far. But really this is giving us breathing space as we keep working towards um, saving you know, what really is an exquisite, beautiful little bird um, from, from almost certain extinction if we don't do anything and act now. So thanks very much and I'll leave it there.